Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg and uh, a very different episode today. We're going to talk with Sean Michael Robinson about digital file preparation, scanning, printing. Um, he got on my radar with his work on the strange death of Alex Raymond with Carson Grubal and Dave Sim. And I have been seeing print pieces of this project for the last year or so of extremely fine lines reproduced in as good a quality as I have seen line art reproduced. And so um, talking to Carson over the last year has led me to Sean, and I'm very excited, hopefully to learn some new tricks and up <laughs> my game, but also something that I think, um, you know, we have a lot of creators that watch cartoonist kayfabe. I think this may be very good information for uh, anybody who's aspiring to create line art and to reproduce that line art, color art, whatever the case may be. Um, but that's what I hope to get into with this conversation. So Sean Michael Robinson, welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. And uh, can we begin with maybe a, a quick professional biography of you? Uh, you know, what <laughs> brought you to this point? What have you done? What should people know about the work that you've made? Because you seem like a Renaissance guy. <laughs> yeah, that's another way of saying uh, that I haven't been able to stick with one thing uh, for longer than a couple of years. Uh, I, I've had a, um, I don't know, an interesting, uh, you know, 20 years of work. Uh, under my belt at this point. Um, I st started off as a musician and played a bunch of different instruments and I've sort of, you know, I taught high school art and um, tried out a lot of different things and sort of tried a sort of safer path for a while. But then in uh, 2010, it was, um, I uh, quit my high school art job and decided I was going to uh, finish a graphic novel I've been working on. I had done a couple hundred pages of that. And uh, somewhere in the mix there, um, I uh, published a uh, article that went viral that was uh, discussing The Wire. It was co-written with a friend of mine, Joey Delaria. And this thing was, you know, a couple, this this thing that we wrote in an afternoon and I drew a couple pictures for was, you know, seen by more people than will ever see anything else that I'll ever touch in my life. And it was a weird experience and uh, sort of got me into a lot of different types of, um, you know, different channels. And um, so one of those channels, um, you know, I had I had done some interviews at that point for the Comics Journal. And I had talked to uh, Gerhard, who is uh, Dave Sims co-artist on uh, service. And uh, I had talked to Dave a couple times on the phone and I had kind of tried to persuade Dave that I'd like to do an interview with him about his comic techniques. And, you know, Dave is a fascinating guy. Uh, he can talk about anything related to comics forever. And, uh, you know, we had a chat one uh, post Christmas day where he just basically told me why there would never be baseball comics in North America. And, you know, listening to Dave Sim talk about baseball comics for 45 minutes is a, you know, a, the type of thing that persuades you, okay, I'm doing the right thing here. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, so I had kind of kept in touch with him. And uh, at a certain point in 2014, or 2000, yeah, 2014, uh, he was having an issue with uh, a new printing of the first two volumes of Cerebus, uh, High Society. And uh, he put out a sort of all points bulletin to, uh, you know, this fan blog for uh, Cerebus is basically like, how can we fix this problem? You know, the printer is telling me that it's the problem with the files. The person who pre prepped the files is telling me it's a problem with the printer. What is it that we're going to do? And um, I, I wrote a few responses to that. And, um, you know, they were forwarded by the guy who was writing the blog. And, you know, I kept on writing responses that kind of got more and more heated. And this was just sort of basically the knowledge that I had at the point, at this point, having pre prepped a book for print, I had done uh, this book uh, down in the hole, I had done the illustrations, and I was the co author of it. And, um, you know, I had had the kind of disappointing print experience of getting your artwork back and seeing all these teeny tiny lines sort of turn into this half tone gray mush. Um, and had done some research based on that and also had been really influenced by Dave's talking about reproduction and glamour puss, uh, and had been really thinking about, you know, the art of the line and, you know, what does it mean to draw something on paper and then get that transmitted to other people. And it struck me as kind of weird that we live in this society where we have technologically evolved, um, in all these different ways. And yet some, things look worse. Uh, printing looks worse. You know, and we live in an era where most books look worse than they did before. How could it be that the things are improving? Uh, the technology is improving, but the product is not. And, uh, you know, some of it uh, could just be that people didn't care about it, but some, some, there must be something else to it. So uh, Dave was basically like, okay, well, look, um, you're the guy. 
And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, you're, you're in charge of this project now. You, I'm going to pay you. <laughs> you know, we've got this Kickstarter. Uh, we've raised X amount of money. Uh, it was a large amount of money. Uh, I'm going to pay you your illustration rate, uh, you know, which I, at the time, I it was $50 an hour. And I said, look, you know, you, you want me to do something other than write you tech stuff. I need to be, you know, I need to be paid instead of drawing, I'm going to be doing this for you. So, you know, and I imagine this was going to be this short project where I was just going to learn about it. I was going to tell him what to do. And then I was going to go away and he was going to uh, be able to put together, you know, his 6,000 page uh, graphic novel in a meaningful way. And it turned out instead uh, that I learned a hell of a lot uh, in a brief period of time uh, and basically dug into everything there was to know about line art reproduction everything there was to know about color reproduction, everything there was to know about the previous generation of uh, print technologies, and just basically soaked all this stuff up and tried to turn myself into a sponge where I was going to take in all that information. Uh, and I, ha I have a background in uh, audio engineering, and uh, that's one of the only things that I've done that I actually went to school for. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, my background in audio engineering, you know, gave and, you know, having recorded a dozen albums and, you know, produced things and engineered things and arranged things had given me a good framework for taking a complex task and breaking it down into smaller manageable pieces. And uh, I sort of set out a roadmap. This is how we're going to do this thing. And uh, Dave wanted to do it the very best way possible, which meant that for the past seven years on and off, every time a book is up. Um, I go through every single available resource for this project. I go through the photo negatives that we have. I go through the original art that we have. I go through other people's scans of original art that fans that have them on their wall have taken them in and got them scanned at the local Kinko's or whatever. And uh, at some cases, I use print sources and I take all of this and try to turn it into the most faithful, cohesive book that is possible. So I've been doing this uh, Cerebus Restoration Project for seven years now i've restored about four thousand seven hundred pages something like that um, i'm hoping to do the last one thousand three hundred pages in the next uh, four months or so here uh because i've got a graphic novel i'm working on uh but basically i have learned just about everything there is to know at the moment about working for print uh and you know for most people that's pretty useless knowledge like i feel sometimes like i'm the you know steal something from Dave. I feel sometimes like I'm the guy who built an Eiffel Tower out of toothpicks, uh, you know, because you can tell somebody at a party like, oh, yeah, you know, I know this, uh, <laughs> this thing. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and yeah, if you're not actually doing this and applying it, you know, if you're not a working cartoonist that maybe is prepping your art yourself, um, I can see how this is not going to be uh, the most exciting conversation for most party goers, uh, no doubt about <laughs> it. Um, wow, that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. This is exactly what I want to talk about, Sean. This is wonderful. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think about like keeping up, keeping everybody up with what's going on. Um, I'd like to plug down in the hole your book. Is that still available for print? In, uh, in print? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, if, you haven't, if you haven't read The Wire and if you haven't uh, read the novels of Charles Dickens and Thackeray, I don't know if it's going to be up your alley. That might be the, uh, the issue with it as far as a commercial product is the Venn diagram of people who are really into the wire and uh, Vanity <laughs> Fair is like this tiny little sliver. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting project. I mean, I, I would also suggest if you're interested in fan art, which is something I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, yeah. it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting piece from that <laughs> angle as well. Um, you mentioned that whenever that comes out, the you weren't happy with the reproduction did you yeah. revise that then and do a subsequent printing did you were you able to like correct that in some way uh no and um the 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 main issue with that is that that i i had it published by somebody else uh so this was not published by me this was published by um a uh, publisher in the in uh, new york and they basically wanted to cut their losses um you know they didn't do any promo for it all the promo that happened was because of uh me and joy pound in the pavement. And I think that basically they were fairly disinterested in it. Uh, once they got past the initial stage, it was supposed to be a rush book. And we wrote and drew the entire thing in a six week period. Wow. Uh, <laughs> which is, you know, it's a 200 page book or whatever. And, uh, you know, 45, 50 illustrations, something, um, while I was doing the musical, um, the music for a play, uh, <laughs> during the day, I mean, it was, it was, it, was, it went from a rush job to a back of the burner uh, job as far as the, the, the publisher was concerned. And 
um, you know, I, I think at some point, um, I think the, the terms of the contract, I could probably take it back and do another published uh, new uh, printing. But at this point, uh, probably in to... all of your free time. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the other thing. We could be talking about multitasking based on the, uh, the descriptions that you've laid down so far of, of what you're doing and what's keeping you busy. Um, shifting, you know, back to the Cerebus project and yeah. sort of, I guess, creating a, a, a print document or a a master printing file of Cerebus, it's very interesting to me because I think a lot of cartoonists and probably a lot of comic book publishers have this issue where they have these archives that are sort of pre-digital and it's, and you know, most of us don't know what we're doing when it comes to scanning, printing, any of this stuff. Um, it feels like it's something that like comics history could benefit from this type of knowledge being applied to, you know, so much of comics history in America at least is, 20th century. And a lot of that work was not prepared digitally or, you know, a, a kind of a master print file prepared for those things. Um, well, have people come up, have, have companies, publishers approached you about this or other cartoonists approached you about this? So I have um, had talks with a few people, uh, very ad hoc. Most publishers uh, that I have talked to, you know, if I've been in a meeting or whatever, um, seem to think that the only thing I can do is this laborious, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I really, we did the Cerebus thing. This is, this is paid for by fans. This is the most laborious thing you can possibly do. Like, how can you make the very best thing? Um, and, and I don't want to, you know, I, don't, I won't go into all the details about what it is that actually, you know, um, but, but basically like, I, I think that people get the impression that, that that's what you do, that well, they don't want that. A publisher wants it to have it done uh, immediately. And the thing is, is that the resources that you, uh, you, you don't have you there's lots of different ways you can choose to do a job like that this is essentially like the you know beach boys project where they've gone back to the original multi-tracks and they've restitched everything back together in order to just make that mix just slightly better um whereas what you can just do as a publisher is you can go back to your physical files and you can make the best scans of the negative possible these are really efficient things to do these are things that an intern can do um, just basically like the the monkey work of scanning it all in. But uh, I'm not persuaded that a lot of publishers have actually kept their physical assets. Um, uh, the the feeling that I get from a lot of this stuff, you know, crawling around in a warehouse uh, in outside of L.A. and finding a bunch of Marvel negatives um, not owned by Marvel, <laughs> uh, like literally in the hands of somebody who's like a, basically a T-shirt salesman. Um, you know, has persuaded me that these companies don't have their physical assets. I think what they what has happened is a lot of them were persuaded by people at the print company that the the one off scan that they made back in 1997 or whenever things really started to switch over uh, was good enough. And so you have these like Marvel Masterwork books that just look like, I mean, toilet paper, you know, with with put through a, um, put through, a, I mean, it, it, there's something called the copy dot process um, that you'll encounter a lot when you start talking to print professionals uh, about this stuff. And they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, well, these negs were done copy dot. And what copy dot means is that these negatives that have a very rich, you know, th this is an amazing process that people invented over time to be able to photograph uh, original art for line art and be able to, these these original negatives when you hold them in their hand in fact i can go grab a service one out of the closet if you want to see it um you can actually see a lot of variation in the lightness and darkness even though they're they're intended to reproduce you know just light and just dark the on press people could push them photographically to uh basically like enhance the amount of detail in the dark areas and things along those lines you can do the same things when you're scanning them uh, but what was done when a lot of these were sort of bulk converted is they were scanned uh, directly to bitmap. That means that they were converted directly to one bit images. And that means that you lose any flexibility. You can't resize anything that had mechanical tone or half toning on it uh, without getting horrible moire patterns. Uh, you're, you're locked into the resolution that it was scanned at. Um, you're locked into the exposure that it was scanned at. And, and uh, what I found with the Cerebus stuff is that of the 16 books of Cerebus, the printer had converted uh, five of them, I think, and they had thrown out the negatives for three of them. Just thrown them in the trash. You know, they ended up in a, you know, a skid, a garbage skid. Um, and, and if 
Dave hadn't had somebody to come in and say, well, hold on, <laughs> don't do that. I mean, he, he had talked to the people at the printer and they're like, yeah, unless you want something the size of a billboard, uh, this is going to be fine. And, you know, he trusted the, the professionals who were working on it. But of course, the professionals have a vested interest in just getting the job off the desk and uh, getting it out the door. And there's a lot of, um, I, I don't want to attribute it all to bad faith either, but uh, there's a lot of, um, let's say, lore around uh, print processes. And you will hear, I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've heard from somebody working at a print factory. Well, human beings can't X. Well, the human eye can't Y. Well, this can't X, this can't Y. This is just a whole list of things. And what it basically boils down to is the people who worked in print in the pre-digital age were very high paid professionals with very technical skills. And then the margins got slimmer and slimmer during that digital uh, process and it pruned all of those high paid people and it replaced them with people who were more like somebody who just works in an office and their office happens to have a giant machine that's, uh, you know, <laughs> makes books. Uh, and, and, and I don't mean that as a knock on people. I mean, you know, I, nobody has to care about this stuff. You know, it's not like the end of the world. Um, but, uh, I mean, it bugs me, you know, I, I think that these physical resources is, should be preserved. So when I'm working on a project, um, I'm scanning things in multi-state and, you know, I'm keeping all of these stages. My, go my goal is that somebody, an archivist who really cares about this 200 years from now could look through all these digital files and do something completely different than make totally different decisions than the ones I made. Uh, anyway, that, that's a long way around saying, uh, yes, I would, I would love to do this type of thing on a consulting basis. Um, but I think when people see the results of what I uh, see, the things I've done so far, they're intimidated by the idea that the process took so long. Um, not knowing that, of course, that I, I could just batch process lots of this stuff. You know, I write, I write uh, batch scripts for everything that I do so that the computer is doing as much work as possible. Um, and, you know, working from negatives alone is easy peasy. It doesn't take more effort to do it the right way. Uh, that's the frustrating thing when it comes to things like, you know, the physical, the physical stuff. Um, it doesn't take more effort to do it the right way. It just takes more, more knowledge beforehand. That's the part that I find frustrating with a lot of the reprints of, let's say, Marvel and DC. Uh, I'm sure they're not the only ones guilty of this, but, you know, a lot of that work is this cherished, beloved kind of stuff. And I'll see reprints and there's a reprint editor credited. Sometimes they even do an intro. And then you start looking and it's like, even the paper choice is a bad choice. Like yeah. that would have taken a half of a second to spec a different paper that would have, you know, made yeah. the work be, you know, be a little bit more flattering to the work. Um, that frustrates me to no end. I often wonder like, what is this person actually doing? If it seems like every creative choice is a, is a bad one here. Right. Um, but I don't want to get uh, too far off of, off of <laughs> this direction. You know, um, the other thing before we dive into the actual process and, and maybe some recommendations you have for all of us in terms of scanning, what to look for, what to yeah. do. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is art restoration. You know, like comics are such this bastard child of art and literature that you know there are these fields that really cherish reproduction and restoration and archiving and i wonder if that was somewhere that you found some of the information that you you know you said you you kind of dove in deep and just learned everything that you could about this is that a, is that one of the fields that uh you learned from uh yeah uh yeah i have an art history background and um you know that that aspect is very interesting to me uh carson and i have talked a lot about uh, about art uh, restoration. Uh, you know, I, I get it easy in a way because everything I'm doing is digital. Uh, you know, I haven't gone over to Kitchener, Ontario and persuaded Dave to rip off a bunch of screen tone so I can digitally retone it or something like that. Um, you know, uh, although, you know, he might do it uh, <laughs> if it made it look better. Um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting that the, the doing this digitally, you know, the heat's off in a certain way. But yeah, there's a huge amount to learn um from that field and also the um you know i've taken a lot of inspiration from like i mentioned before the beach boys uh, project uh you know i'm really and, glad you said that because i have friends who are uh musicians and into music and they talk about how you these things are mastered for different things you know like right. what sounds great on a record is sort of mastered for that record for the vinyl uh, you know, and it's not necessarily adjusted whenever people shift to making CDs, you know, in the 90s or something. And as a result, 
it's not the same, you know, it's not, so it's not the, the equivalent or, you know, one does sound better than the other because it's built for that particular media. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, the, the money that was in, uh, audio, uh, was at the time, uh, meant that people really did think about these things in a, I think more comprehensive way. Uh, and you had, yeah, like you have, a the master, the flat, what's called the flat master, uh, that's a meant it's like a pre master for any medium. And then you have these what are called pre emphasis masters that were made for an LP. Uh, and they had the bass rolled off and had the high end accentuated. And when these record companies first started re releasing stuff on CD, they would just take the pre emphasis master, because that's the one that they'd used before. And they just put that out as the CD release and everybody wonders well, why does CD sound like garbage. Uh, but the, the truth is that the digital medium doesn't have any kind of flavor to it at all. Um, but people learned that, oh, this digital thing sounds so harsh. It sounds like this. It sounds like that. And a lot of it just had to do with people not really going back to the source. You know, the source should be the actual flat master. And then, you know, you have people like, um, I, I wish I could remember his name, Mark Lynette, I believe, believe his name is, who worked on the Beach Boys project for the first time in the uh, late 90s, who was like, oh my gosh, this Pro Tools thing. I can go back to these pre-bounced Beach Boys mixes and I can combine them with the later stages that they did and we could just do another remix. And, you know, it, he did this and basically set out this meticulous process for how do you take all of these different analog elements and basically use the very best of the technology to combine these things in a way that is makes the thing more like the thing. That's the sort of that's the sort of goal post that I have when I'm working on the uh, art restoration. How do you make the thing more like the thing? You never want to make it less like the thing. You don't want to go through and, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the equivalent would be, but you, you know, you always want it to look like how did this artist envision it was going to be in the printed, you know, in the actual printed form. And so the way it left their artboard should be the sort of guidepost for you. Yeah. And one of the interesting things, and I think it was in Glamour Puss, is as Dave Sim is, is sort of exploring uh, techniques of different newspaper cartoonists, he will get into this idea of some of the hatching that's there is in order to limit what, say, the engraver can adjust, right? If there's right. some fine lines, you can only do so much adjustment without ruining those. And so, uh, at least in Glamour Puss, he puts forth this idea that some of these artists would find these ways to control the engraver so that the art wasn't reproduced <laughs> too dark or too light, um, right. you know, pushed too far out of their control, which is again, fascinating to, I don't know, seven of us, but to the seven <laughs> of us that are interested, it's really interesting, you know, because look, I'm, I'm, I mostly make my own comics and that means I'm doing everything I can up to handing them to the printer in many cases. So right. any way that I can make that output or that, that finished piece look better or look more the way I want it to look. I mean, that's hugely valuable to me. And even if you're not um, an independent cartoonist, more and more people that work at Marvel and DC and image, wherever it is, you are sending your files in digitally. You know, it's no right. longer, here's the original art on paper. You guys take care of it. It's more and more of like, here's the file. So, right. uh, you know, up to that point, like you're responsible for, you know, delivering the best file possible. And that's really what I want to get into. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get into it. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the two things I want to say uh, right off the top is that you were talking about two different things when you were talking about line art and when you're talking about color or grayscale reproduction. Uh, so we have different a different set of limitations and a different set of uh, things to watch out for. So basically, uh, when we were talking about line art, uh, you know, I mean, we all know what line art is because we all did it, you know, in the sand with a stick or with a piece of charcoal on the sidewalk, or when we were a little kid, then you get the pen for the first time and you're like, oh, look at this line, you know? <laughs> uh, that visceral connection with the line, um, there are actual physiological reasons for it. Um, your vision is more perceptive and sharper uh, when it comes to uh, edges. And basically the harder the edge is and the, the uh, higher the contrast it is, um, the, the, more, uh, the more sensitive you are to uh, nuance of that. And so uh, because of that, and because of the sort of general processes that we have, it's really important that line art uh, be reproduced without a halftone process. And what that means is that basically the, the, the little lines on the plate should correspond directly to the lines that you made on the paper. 
Uh, they shouldn't be filtered through any kind of halftone process at all. And this is such a basic thing, uh, but it is amazing to me the amount of uh, product out there. Um, this is an appropriate use of the word product, I think, uh, where somebody didn't get the memo uh, on this. Um, and what happens when you have tone line art is you get a very weak kind of watered down thing. And I think you lose some of that visceral connection to it as well. Um, and so uh, when, when you as the cartoonist are making these lines, uh, you have to sort of hold it on faith that they're going to get to the printed paper. But each of these steps that you go along, um, you know, you have to really shepherd and work on retaining that. So basically, the first step is to make sure that you get a good color scan of your artwork. Uh, with the uh, Cerebus project and with and with uh, the strange death of Alex Raymond, um, because of the size they were working at, um, I, as a general rule, uh, you, they were working both at working at a basically like a 10 by 15 uh, on an 11 by 17 sheet. And so Dave's originals were all scanned uh, in 600 pixels per inch in color. And uh, and then uh, Carson's originals, some of them were at 600 pixels per inch and some of them were 1,200 pixels per inch, uh, which is overkill for almost everything. But if you've seen Carson's pages in that book, you'll know why uh, we did it that way, uh, because it is absurd <laughs> what, what he can do with uh, a brush. Um, and, uh, you know, he was he brought him over to my house and it was fun to just hang out anyway, so it didn't matter if it took four times longer to scan it. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, the the. A, just a general rule, um, if you're going to work to to reduce something, that 600 pixels per inch in color is going to be a good way to do it. And then basically what you're going to do after that um, is uh, toss out uh, the color channel and reduce it to um, a grayscale file. And you're going to scale it up to the size you're actually going to print it at. I say scale it up even though you're reducing it. So in the case of like a Cerebus original, um, uh, they were originally reduced to 60% of the original art size. So, you know, you drawn on, um, drawn 10 by 15, and then eventually reduced to like six inches, right? Um, 60%. So uh, in Photoshop, um, I'm using usually bicubic um, as the, uh, as the, uh, as the upscale method. And I'm doing that 60% of, and then I'm changing the resolution to 2,400 pixels per inch. This is the part where you start freaking people out uh, because uh, <laughs> 2,400 pixels per inch is not a standard recommended uh, resolution. Uh, but the thing is, uh, when we first got into this Cerebus uh, project, I really did tests on every single thing that was gonna be in the series because I wanted to make sure that the, from the first page that I produced, everything in the series is gonna be able to reproduce uh, that way. And uh, basically, there was some teeny tiny tone that they had used in uh, the book Jaka Story. Uh, this this like 10% uh, tone in the background of a, a whole sequence of the book. And I just was persuaded this just no way this fits in a resolution space that is the sort of recommended resolution. You always hear people say, okay, 1200 pixels per inch. This is this is the space that you work in with with line art. That's the maximum. I talked to a friend of mine who is a uh, press person in Seattle and basically asked him, like, when they when you guys make printing plates, what's the resolution that the print plate is actually made at? Like, what does the plate setter work at? What's the resolution? And he said, oh, 2,400 pixels per inch. And the, basically, almost every, every print shop, this is what their plate set is actually made at. So they have this, this thing called a plate setter that's making the actual printing plate from the files. All those plate setters, unless you uh, work at a specialty print shop that does like micro printing, like security tags and things like that, they max out at 2,400 pixels per inch. So the reason that someone's submitting a file at 1,200 is because that's a multiple of that destination number. Um, and so basically I was like, okay, can I, well, can I pause one second yeah, here? Sure. Um, what you're referring to in terms of line art would be mm -hmm. bitmap. Uh, is that right? It, it gets converted to bitmap at the final stage. Yeah. Okay. So we're still in a grayscale whenever we're at yeah. 2,400 pixels mm -hmm. per inch. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's a large document. Uh, it's not a slow document. Uh, if, if you're working in grayscale, uh, if you were doing this in color, that would be, that this is, it would be ridiculous. There's no reason to work in color at that resolution. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of getting into the weeds here, I think, uh, without giving the, 
the, the necessary background. Basically, like when you're half toning something, the resolution doesn't have to be nearly as high. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because the half tone process, you're, you're taking and creating little dots that are making up the entirety of the image, and that softens your view of that object. Um, but line art, you don't have that same kind of advantage. Um, I, well, I mean, it's a disadvantage and an advantage, but, but basically like your, your color perception is so different than your line art perception that those resolution issues matter a lot more. Uh, so basically, uh, when we first, uh, I, I just decided, look, Dave, the sequence in the book, um, needs to be 2,400 pixels per inch. There's no reason that we shouldn't do the entire book that way. It's not really other than some storage space things, you know, there's no reason not to do it. It's not slower. It doesn't change anything. I might have to persuade the printer to keep it at that resolution. Uh, but you know, we should be working with the printer that we can trust anyway. So what does it matter? Right. Um, and, and what we found after the first book, the, the first book was printed pretty poorly and you didn't really see any benefit, uh, from that because the, the, the printer did such a poor job, but we switched printers for the second book and I, I just could not believe the difference it made with the actual fine line. And basically like you're taking this, you know, when you're talking about doubling the resolution, you're talking about having four times the amount of information. Um, because the, you know, you're, if you can imagine, like, instead of something being made of one squ square, it's made of four squares instead. So you're quadrupling the amount of pixels that are representing this. Um, and you know, the, the actual files that you're delivering are still teeny tiny. So basically like you bring it up to the, you bring it up to the file size that you're going to want to do. And then, um, you, you try to overcome the next hurdle and that is getting everything sharp enough so that all of the edge information is going to survive making it into a bitmap, uh, making it into a what one bit image. And I say a one bit image, that means that every pixel is either on or it's off. It's either black or it's white. You have to do this so that the print plate itself can just be the image or not the image. This is like a finalization, right? But the thing is, you don't, you shouldn't do that until you've made all the adjustments that you need to make. Um, that means bringing it up to size. That means uh, sharpening, which we'll get into, I, I think, when we do the screen share. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you got time for it, <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and and everything like that, um, and basically, uh, if, if you think about if you think about it, um, the what you're actually butting up against here is um, the reason you make it that large line art space, the 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 large resolution space, is so that the finest of those details can look as most like themselves as possible. So you know, if you draw a big chunky marker drawing. Um, and you know, you do it with like an extra sharp, large Sharpie and it ends up looking like, uh, Mike Mignola, um, you know, took off his glasses. Um, it is not going to matter a lick, whether your resolution is 600 pixels per inch bitmap or 1,200 pixels per inch bitmap or a 2,400 pixels per inch bitmap, because there's no fine lines to not resolve. In other words, the, the frequency of your information matters. Um, and so I sort of stumbled into this just because of the dot tone thing. I just sort of stumbled into this basically being like, well, why can't you reproduce these little dots? I mean, the printer makes half tones all the time where the dots are just that fine. Why, why does it, where's the, where's the difference? And the difference is that people aren't delivering their line art files at a high enough resolution. Um, so that being said, um, you know, you can find images all day that wouldn't make a difference to be in a high resolution space. Um, and if you're color, if you're covering an image with color plates as well, it also, the difference between 1,200 pixels per inch and 2,400 pixels per inch, when you've got a bunch of color on top of it, I mean, is negligible or zero. I'll uh, point out this for, uh, something for, again, people who want to use this in their work to keep in mind, <clears throat> inking has become, um, optional in a lot of comics, uh, right. whether you're drawing digitally, whether you're painting, whether you're reproducing pencil, um, which we can talk about reproducing pencil too, but 
if you are inking at this point, it's almost this, um, I hate to use the word fetish, but it is sort of a very specific detail and look and style that you're going for. And so that's why you would want to reproduce that at the highest fidelity possible, because you're really doing, you're making a creative choice whenever you're choosing to do, um, you know, ink lines. And so that's why you would want this, um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a big part of the style that you're choosing to employ in your art. So you want to reproduce that uh, obviously as well as possible. And that, that's specifically where this, what you're describing, uh, would really be applied. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and I, I truly believe that there's a more visceral reaction we have to line art. Uh, I think it gives us some kind of immediate response and, you know, I, not, not to be too esoteric, but you know, you're, you're, uh, <laughs> I suppose, uh, I too late know, for that. You. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your, your, your vision systems for black and white seeing are completely different than your vision systems for color seeing. And uh, your, your... From an evolutionary standpoint, we developed the black and white vision far earlier than we developed the color system. So it's, it's a much older system within our uh, vision system. Right. And Carson refers to it as edge detection. And basically, you imagine what a moth has to be able to see in order to avoid getting eaten by a bird. Uh, and you sort of picture why it is that we want to have a immediate reaction to um, certain kinds of visual stimuli. And, you know, I, I really think I, I do, I truly do believe that we read an image in a way that we almost never read a color image. It's, it's a different kind of experience. I've um, never that considered that at all, but you think about reading text on paper and it's almost always black on, on white. Um, you know, line, essentially, yeah. uh, it's interesting to think about like a line art as, as a piece that you read. Uh, yeah, yeah and, that's it can, neat. and it can be deeply unsettling to sit down to a novel and find it like an orange or something. I mean, it's not, it's not the same experience to read text that's that's in color. I mean, I don't know exactly, you know, I'd be curious to see if this is a researchable thing. But, um, you know, or, or we're, we're a, a bunch of fetishists who love our uh, 200 year old pens. <laughs> Right, and, which I do. So you know, guilty as charged. <laughs> um, yeah. So so basically, um, you know, I, 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 here I'm trying to describe a process that I can, you know, I can show you. So I'll maybe I, I should try to just pull back just a little bit and say that when you're reproducing for color, your 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 goals are very different. And uh, working in color, um, you know, your resolution space never needs to be higher than 600 pixels per inch. Um, this is another thing, by the way, that you will hear pushback from from the printer. Uh, you know, the printers will oftentimes assert that 400 pixels uh, per inch or 4, 450 pixels per inch is good enough for grayscale or color files. And uh, that is undoubtedly true if you're talking about soft images, uh, images that don't have a lot of what I'm calling a high frequency information. But uh, when we look at something like your ballpoint pen, uh, drawings in a minute here, uh, those are covered with high frequency information. And that extra bit of resolution uh, helps those high frequency aspects get through the screening process. And so basically, uh, you want to ha have help that along as much as you can. And so keeping it in the high resolution space, and then doing a bunch of sharpening. Those are the things that help it help those high frequency aspects push through the screening process. Uh, so you know, two totally different things. Um, but but, uh, you know, they 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 behave. Um, the principles are, are fairly simple to understand. And what what it what it kind of falls down on is when you're looking at something that has been inappropriately scanned. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, it comes to you in a way that's just totally, you know, you don't know what to do with it at all. Like that's when, you know, having done this now for seven years really benefits uh where i can problem solve in a fairly you know quick um amount of time i mean i i feel like i could teach somebody the basics of like how to do something in the best possible way you know in an hour or two um but but teaching somebody how to troubleshoot every possible thing especially when you're dealing with archival materials that's a whole other whole other subject should we dive into an example? Do you want to, you know, walk us through through some of yeah. these points? Uh, let let me uh, get this started here. All right, can you see my screen now? I can. Yeah, excellent. Great. Um, so, so Jim, uh, the 
this uh, scan right here is a great example of the what we were talking about before. So this is done with ballpoint pen, is that right? That's right. Fantastic drawing, by the way. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a great example of what we were talking about in terms of color reproduction and where it really matters what the resolution is. So uh, this needs to be reproduced in color because uh, obviously you're not just getting, you're, you're, you're getting a lot of contrast between your lines here uh, in terms of your actual handling, right? I mean, that's the point you're, of drawing it with a ballpoint pen. It's more like a pencil or a silver point uh, as opposed to a pen, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I never think about it that way, but that's absolutely right. So you've got this feathering here in the back uh, that's pushing that much lighter than the hatching over here. And it's not just because you're um, using a thinner or a thicker line, it's because you've got a value change there too. You've got these being actually lighter than this. And so because of that, we're gonna need to reproduce this as a color image. Uh, so that's where uh, the color resolution really matters. And if you look, uh, your scan right here, uh, this is optically sharp, what's called optically sharp, and that your scanner has captured it very well, uh, but it is not sharp enough to look sharp in print. And so we're actually gonna use an external solution on this. The resolution uh, looks like it's fine to me, but um, let's go ahead and check it. So are you gonna reproduce this at size? That's my plan. Great. So I'm gonna hit uh, Control Alt I to bring up the size dialog in Photoshop. And we're gonna view this in terms of inches and uh, resolution. So you've got this at 600 pixels per inch at the actual size that you uh, drew it at. So that is gonna be great. So this is gonna be exactly what we're gonna use for our final image. And uh, is it okay with you if I go ahead and flatten this frame that you've made here? Yes, for okay. sure. So I'm gonna flatten this, I'm gonna merge these layers. And um, let's go ahead and, and uh, duplicate this layer too. And we're gonna name this sharpened. Uh, and just for the sake of this uh, as a demonstration, so we can easily turn on and off and see what it is that we've actually done. And so I'm gonna get right up in here and really take a look. And uh, first off, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a little uh, adjustment here because I see that you got a hair. <laughs> hey, I saw that when you zoomed in. <laughs> in your scan. So uh, using the clone stamp tool, make a little adjustment here. Uh, so really getting up in here, uh, I'm going to give it a first layer of sharpening. And what I'm going to use, I'm going to go to filter sharpen. This is what's called unsharp mask. This is the crudest possible way you can do this. And uh, this is actually... Believe it or not, this was a process that was available in the darkroom uh, in the past, in a pre-digital age. Uh, and what they would do is they would make a blurry version of a certain image, and they would overlay the blurry version with the image they want to sharpen. And that result would, uh, outputting that result would actually sharpen up the edges. So what this essentially is, is like a contrast adjustment for the edges. You have three different controls for this tool here. This is an amazing tool. This is a tool that I use every single day. Unsharp Mask. This is the dumbest possible version of this tool. Uh, Adobe makes you know a dozen more and they're all ridiculous. You don't need any of them. This is the only one that you need. It's got three controls, okay? Amount. This is basically how much contrast adjustment are we doing, okay? If you see, if I put it up to 500, you start to see some ridiculous artifacts here. That's because this is already an optically sharp image. In other words, your, your scanner is good. You've got a good scanner. Your capture is good, right? That's the thing that matters the most. So because you have a normal capture, this amount does not need to be particularly high. Okay? Um, and uh, radius is how wide is this effect? You see, if I make the radius like 100 pixels, you got some really crazy things happening. Basically, you start to fill in and it's not just filling in the, the lines, you're filling in the gaps as well. So this radius, unless you're looking for a particular kind of effect or you have a very blurry image, um, you know, the, ra the radius control is not something that you really you know, need to keep very high on a regular basis. And then the last control is the threshold. The threshold is basically like, how much does it grab? So the lower that we make our threshold, if I put it all the way down, it's basically grabbing everything. If I put the threshold to zero, 
it's going to grab everything. It's even going to grab noise in the paper and things like that. That's actually not a desirable thing. This uh, first thing that we're going to do here is basically I'm going to keep the threshold fairly low, but not to zero. In zero, you really start to get some weird artifacts because it starts grabbing like the JPEG compression if you saved it as a JPEG and things like that. So I'm going to keep this threshold. Um, 12 looks pretty good to me. And I'm keeping the, the radius fairly low here because basically what I'm doing right now is I'm just basically trying to bring out the texture of what you've drawn. This is just an attempt to basically, we're going to try to get some of this high uh, frequency information through the print process. So I'm going to turn it on and off here. Hopefully you can see that. I'll, I'll zoom in even more <laughs> in case people were watching on a low resolution device. Keep in mind, I'm working on a 4K monitor right here that I've calibrated. I've color calibrated the monitor. Um, I color calibrate my scanner so that I'm inputting exactly, you know, as, as accurate to the color as I can. Um, <clears throat> all those are different topics, by the way, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> this looks pretty good to me. I've got a low threshold. I've got a low radius and my amount is fairly low too, about 150%. And so this is just a first pass. The idea of this is that we've just brought out some of the texture here. Um, <clears throat> you can get fairly extreme with that, but there's no need to. Like I said, this is a good scan. And now the second pass that we're going to do here is going to be to exaggerate some of the larger areas of, of contrast. And actually, we might have been able to do that a little higher. Um, maybe I'll do one more pass at a, the same settings, but just a slightly lower amount. Because I actually, I think that looks a little better now that I'm zoomed out. I'm take, paying attention to my percentage. I'm at 100% right now. So actually, this might be a little heavy. Okay, so let's do one more pass. And I'm going to change the settings this time. I'm going to raise the radius to something more along the lines of like four or five pixels. And I'm going to bring the threshold down. So now it's only really accentuating the areas that have higher contrast. Basically, it's grabbing less now. Since I've moved the threshold up, we're grabbing less. So this is basically like to ensure that the highest areas of contrast have a lot of punch to them. You think about this as like your punch. This is like the those, those highest areas are really getting it. Okay, and that looks pretty good to me. Um, I can try boosting the amount a little bit. Yeah, that's decent right there. Okay, so the amount is actually less than before. It's affecting less. Uh, and that, my friend, is ready for print. Uh, the only real question I would have about an image like this beyond here is how much of the paper you want to knock out. Uh, but since you've intentionally drawn this, and go back to intention already, you've intentionally drawn this on, uh, you know, where we can see what the object is. Uh, you've incorporated the object into your composition. You know, you've got these lines going straight through it. I mean, obviously, we're not going to knock out all those. So basically, to me, knocking out the paper in this situation is less important. But just for the hell of it, let's go ahead and make a new adjustment layer. I'm going to go to new adjustment layer curves. And we do this as an adjustment layer just so that you can turn it on and off easily without um, damaging the image. It's not applying this. It's just applying this in real time. So now that actually looks a heck of a lot better to me. Um, so what I've done up in the curves here is this, you can see this spike here, Jim? Yes. Um, this, this spike is where your information is. You see how it falls off from that peak? Mm -hmm. All of this is unused bandwidth. This is basically like telling me that the highlights of your image are all over here instead. So um, if I bring it way up, you start to get that white of the paper. I bring it too far up, you start to blow out your high frequency information. So there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off right here with this particular thing, at least working for an image that's, not, that's gonna be half-toned, there's a trade-off. Uh, we'll talk about it with the line art, but uh, there's not the same trade off with line art because you can just sharpen the bejesus out of it until you get everything in there. Um, but because these have a different value than these other lines, that's not really a possibility for us. We're not going to reproduce that as line art. And so how does uh, at least, you know, you're not you're not on the same monitor as me, but how are you? How are you seeing this image right now? Uh, I, so the sharpness is something that I have not typically done. I, 
it's funny because I used to do that with um, like adjusting photos for print, mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that I do on my scan work. So that's interesting to bring that back in. One thing I tend to do and probably more in line art, but I do it a little bit on these ballpoint pen and color pieces is I adjust levels. Uh, and, it, and it feels similar to um, what I'm seeing with the curves, right? You know, usually uh, even the, the information, you know, like whenever you look at that curve graph and you say like to the right there, um, you know, that gray spike kind of falls off and you have a little bit of um, unused uh, information or whatever there. Right. Um, I feel like when you look at like levels adjustment, yep. there's often a similar thing. There is a hundred percent. So this, this, uh, this curve right here or sorry the, the the graph right here is the same as the one that you would see if i brought up the levels command uh the reason i've let off levels levels is a lot easier to understand and i think that that is what i'd use for most of the time uh the reason i stopped doing levels is because photoshop has a glitch in it where it doesn't record levels all the time for uh scripts um and so if, if you look over here for instance i have a i have some scripts going um you can see that I got Cerebus Actions 2021, Cerebus Archive Scans, Gerhard Sharpen Scans uh, Correction or whatever. Um, I, I do scripts for everything. And so uh, because Photoshop has a glitch currently <laughs> involving levels, I'm just doing this on curves instead. Okay. Um, but it makes me feel better, actually. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm like, great. man, am I behind here? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's basically the same thing. So, so on the levels, um, grabbing this over here on the left, um, is the same as using the white knob on the levels. Grabbing this on the right, the black one is the same as using the black one on the levels. And then this is your mids control from the levels. But the thing is with the curve is that you can affect it in different ways. So basically like if you were just grabbing the mid slider and moving it, this is the same. Yes. Um, but this gives you a graphic representation of what's happening when you do that. So yeah, look, I, I imagine uh, it would also allow you to grab it rather than just, you know, like levels or your your midpoint and your white and, and black. This right. would allow you to be more nuanced, like it looks like there, you know, you're, you're grabbing 25% in or you, you got you know, it. roughly. And, so and, and that's kind of nice. And bringing that up and bringing the other one down does all types of crazy things to your image. Uh, you can start to see inside of the shadowed areas. Um, you know, you, you rarely want to make these kind of extreme adjustments on something unless something has been really messed up on the way in. Uh, the, the way to think about this stuff uh, from an audio perspective, that's what's called signal path. And basically, um, the further you get down the chain, the less desirable it is to make changes there. And uh, the signal path thing applies to an artist as well. If you're making art on paper, uh, obviously, the very best thing you can do is correct something on paper. Uh, and then the next most important thing after the actual art that you made is the scanning. And while you can correct things after the fact of the scan and, you know, with these types of adjustments, these are, these are painless. These are not things that, you know, you need to correct at the scan. Um, you know, it's always better to do it if you can, you know, at the, the previous step anyway. Um, the, so th this is basically like a, a fancy pants, um, a fancy pants levels correction. Yeah, greater greater control, which you know I love as a micromanager. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my obsessive personality. <laughs> well, that's interesting as a micromanager that you you uh, do ballpoint pen drawings over uh, blue uh, lines. So you're giving up a certain part of the process at the beginning. Uh, a little bit, but you know the I, I think the notebook paper does add something to it. Oh yeah, because um, I've shown these and you'll see people react like everybody. It's probably we're probably losing it in terms of generations now, but everybody of say 40 years or older, you know, like we were all traumatized staring at notebooks and doodling in our notebooks. And I right. think the notebook brings a lot of value to it. The other thing that I found interesting when I started doing these ballpoint pen drawings, I experimented with all types of paper, very good paper, you know, and I found that the paper that had like uh, maybe the better paper with more fiber, terrible with the ballpoint pens, like the ballpoints right. would get clogged up and it. This paper actually worked really well. You know, photocopy printer paper, I, I find works equally well, but mm -hmm. uh, I often, I like the notebook part, you know? So well, there, there are some trade-offs. Sometimes I think about drawing it on the, uh, on, you know, lineless paper, and then I can always add the lines, but that feels a little bit like cheating to me, right. so. Well, you, you're, you're, you're uh, exaggerating the objectness of it. You're, you're inviting someone to see this as an, as an art object, as opposed to a, amorphous 
thing. I think that as we enter the digital age, or we've been in the digital age for a while, but the the objectness of something takes on a different kind of poignancy to it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that earlier, whenever you were talking about just books in general not being produced well. And right. like, I have that opinion of, we can do this stuff digitally, so share it digitally. But if you're going to make the print object, if you're going to make the book, figure out how to make the best you can in print. And that's the thing that I see people drop the ball with. Um, you know, this is a little bit extreme version of that because my plan is to reproduce a notebook. Um, right. But just from a practical standpoint, like if you're going to bother to, to translate this into a printed book of any sort, you want to maximize that stuff. Whatever the qualities come with print, you want to certainly incorporate those. Right. And uh, if you were uh, my client who was coming to me and asking me how to do this particular project, uh, the thing that I would very much encourage you to do is to make sure that all of your scans are in the same state. And the reason for that is because if you were happy with the adjustments that we just made, all of those things are scriptable. Right. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to click create a new action and I'm going to call this Jim Rug Notebook scan and we could go back through i'm gonna stop uh, stop the recording right here uh stop the um action recording we could go back through each of those stages and redo each of them while recording that action and then you could batch process all of these so you know you you go through and you scan 200 of these and then you run that batch and you're still going to want to go in and do some amount of manual editing most likely like if you have a bunch of hair on his nose right uh, in your scan, obviously the computer, you know, script is not going to go through and uh, eliminate that for you. But but that the majority of that work is then done uh, for you. So yes. setting up a script for yourself, that is the way to do it. And actually, that's the way that I've done. Um, you were asking about other people. Some of the people that I've uh, done freelance work for, I've just written them a script. They sent me a, a scan and I say, OK, tweak this and tweak that. They tweak this and they tweak that. They send me another scan and I say, okay, these are your settings. You were locked into this setting. Here's your script. And then they output the whole thing. And, uh, you know, they get to the last stage and then they, they export their PDF and they send it to me before they send it to their printer. And I say, uh, you messed up your settings on the PDF and everything is reduced to uh, 72 <laughs> pixels per inch uh, screen. <laughs> and, I shouldn't you know, laugh. but <laughs> that, that, that might be an hour's worth of work for me. But the difference between the two projects is, I mean, night and day. I mean, you know, to have someone and, you know, as as cartoonists, you know, you can be very. It, it, it can be tempting to just kind of go it alone. But like when it comes to this type of stuff, I mean, I don't know if everybody should <laughs> learn <laughs> every aspect of this type of process stuff, because it frankly can drive you nuts. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there's something to be said for drawing it in your notebook and then, you know, having a, uh, trusted person come and scan it or whatever, you know, go through the process. Maybe, maybe you like the micromanaging everything, or maybe you trust somebody to do that part for you. So trust anyway, it's a good word for that too. Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe it's trust issues that I'm yeah. dealing with, not just micromanagement and, and uh, OCD. <laughs> well, let, let's go ahead and take a look at the, um, at the, the AB um i'm gonna group these so we can turn it off easily uh so here's here's the before and here's the after and we are at on my monitor we're at 100 percent right now which you know in fairly far it is interesting um i often say one of the places where i would see weird digital to print issues was that often the print would look much darker than it looks on a monitor. And I would, right. I would kind of train my myself almost like one of these batch processes where, or, or one of these uh, actions that I would record where it was like, I know what it looks like on screen and what it looks like in print. Mm -hmm. And I would describe it to friends of mine who were trying to do this as like, you sort of want it to, it will look wrong on screen, uh, <laughs> essentially. Otherwise it will, it will look darker in print. And uh, it's a weird notion. Like you almost need the reps and seeing it printed to have the confidence that this thing I'm looking at on screen is not quite what I want it to be. And I say that because when I look at this adjusted image, that unsharpened, the level of unsharpness in like the pen strokes 
it's a little bit off to me. You know what I mean? Like in my head, I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, you know what you're doing here. I would trust you. I would defer to your, you and your experience that this is going to print properly. Um, The sharpened sharpened one looks wrong to you. The, the unsharp looks very um, almost crisp. Um, Yeah. Well, and so and, I'm not used of, to looking at that. And it, and it's, it's, it's interesting for me to see that because I trust that would print right. But to my eye, it's like, mm, but okay. You're, you're also seeing right now, you're not seeing my screen capture. That's you're true. Seeing, you're seeing me through the zoom filter and all the zoom encoding and everything like that. Very um, true. It, it's interesting though. We, you know, the, I, I did a bunch of one-off tests with this stuff where um, and this is something that you can test for yourself, uh, Jim. Uh, basically, if you can go to a local copy store that has one of those very large Xerox, color Xerox uh, uh, assemblies that has a, a can print 11 by 17 uh, on coated paper, uh, specifically ask for coated paper and do some tests there. The output of those machines is comparable in sharpness to um, an offset process. That is fantastic to hear. I was going to ask you about that uh, because some of the materials that brought me to you, I assume they were printed in small quantities yep. and I wondered if they were all offset, if some of them were digitally printed. Yep, the, the, everything except for uh, Strange Death, uh, those, those little um, books that we sent that are in color are all uh, done digitally. That blows and, uh, my mind. I wouldn't have and, thought that in a million years. Not only were they done digitally, uh, they were done by the cheapest printer in North America. <laughs> you want to give them a plug? Uh, I, I do. Uh, Printing Center USA uh, does a fantastic job uh, with color stuff. Absolutely fantastic job. It's insane to me that people are not using them right and left. Any cartoonist that um, you know does small quantity color work should be working with them. Um, This uh, sounds revolutionary to be very honest with you because I do zines, I do small, you know, small quantities. And whenever the quality is subpar, I assume, well, that's a limitation of, you know, the color, the the color laser printer or whatever they're using. Uh, It's it's probably a limitation on my preparation of the files. It's very possible. Uh, Yeah. And the, the thing about this stuff, um, you know, the sharpening stuff really seems like voodoo uh, until you actually go through and really do an analysis of the result. Uh, and so when when we had one of these uh, service Kickstarters to raise money for the thing, um, I, I just went down to the copy shop and I just drove them nuts. I was like, OK, here, print print all 12 of these. I'm going to look at all these. And I went through and actually scanned in the results of the printing. Uh, so I took these. Um, I took these uh, printed results and scanned them back in and looked at the image after it had been through the halftone. And that's when I started arriving at the conclusion of um, on a 4K monitor really up close, you want to make it look crispy. And and the reason is because it has to survive the process of being filtered through those four different color planes uh, happening simultaneously. You have to give, especially images with this high frequency information, you have to make those things have enough contrast so that when your eye is getting fooled by those those four color overlays, um, it gets through. And uh, actually looking at those uh, one-on-one was a real revelation for me um, when I realized, oh, this thing looks crispy. And then I, I, I bring up the, it doesn't look that way at all in print. And then I bring it up, the scan of it, and I look at it side by side, and it's like you can't see any of that crispiness because, of course, it's being filtered through, uh, you know, four different layers of dots. <laughs> Um, yeah. And back to your printers who say that the human eye can't see X or Y, like we probably yeah. can't see the level of, you know, 2,400 pixels per inch, whatever that prints out to, whatever their resolution is on the printing device. Like, can we see, you know, four or 600 dots per inch? You know, yeah. it, it, it does, I'm sure, blur together to some extent. It's a neat idea about the um, the scanning them. Whenever I had done aphrodisiac, which was really about like old comic book printing processes. Well, that's not what it was about, but I mean, that was a big part of what it was about to me. Um, I learned so much because I would scan old comic books at mega resolution and I would be looking at them, you know, where an inch, a square inch of the book or uh, of the scan would fill up my screen so that I could really see like, how is that ink bleeding? What is the, you know, what is the texture on that page? Uh, And they were, it was like a whole different world looking at it that way. So it makes sense to do that with, uh, with prints. 
Right. And you get right up in there and, and, you know, compare the results and it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, I have so, another question. I don't know if this is the time to ask it, but since we're here, yeah, no. One thing I struggle with is reproducing the blue that you see there in like a CMYK process. Um, any thoughts on that? If you were going to send this to your printer, would you send uh -huh. it as an RGB file or as a CMYK file? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, uh, if you are worried about it, the best thing you can do is do the conversion yourself. Um, if, if it's something where you have been dissatisfied with that particular thing in the pro in, in the past, you should do the conversion yourself. And once again, this is something that's scriptable. You can just add this to the back end of your thing. Um, you know, you can even have this as a script that runs afterwards, but, um, basically if you go to, uh, let's see, where is this? Um, this is an edit, uh, convert to profile. Okay. And, um, if you take a look at, uh, this, uh, Adobe enables you to convert to, we're going to use working CMYK uh, swap version two, and it gives you a several different um, options as far as how to do the conversion. And uh, what you might find is that um, there's a certain uh, version of this that gives you a much better result. So the relative color metric in my eye is uh, keeping some of the intensity here. Um, but it's also possible that you've got a sort of purplish hue, uh, to it. So it might be that you really are getting some kind of either your pen itself is not really hewing very close to the blue, uh, spectrum, or your, your scanner itself needs to be set up and calibrated. Um, there's a guy uh, in Germany who sells a $25, uh, color scanner. Uh, calibrators. And uh, it's basically a test sheet that you can use. If you give a professional uh, scanning software, I would really highly recommend ViewScan. Um, you can do calibration inside of the program and uh, make sure that your scan really is, um, you know, coming across in the way that you want it to. But yeah, when I'm looking at this right now, uh, relative color metric looks like the best, like in the box uh, uh, solution, but it does have a pretty high dip uh or a pretty pretty steep dip in terms of your color intensity which would suggest to me that this is not a true blue that we've got some kind of color mix happening here that's that's not been yeah this looks like a purple to me when i'm just sampling uh a little bit we've got 100 percent uh cyan 100 percent magenta and then um a, a fair bit of yellow and black in those dark areas anyway so um, I would take a look at your color calibration and it's possible that, you know, you might tweak this a little bit if you want to give it like a real true blue intensity. Purple is still um, a, a place where color tends to fall off in, um, in uh, color reproduction, for, for color reproduction. And uh, so anytime you have an issue like that, you should consider doing the color conversion uh, yourself. And uh, I, I should say uh, too, I, Carson and I have been talking about different things to do. We, you know, Carson and I have a YouTube channel. Uh, we've been doing mostly book reviews from a fairly nerdy perspective in terms of like, we'll flip through and then we'll talk about reproduction. We'll talk about how the eye works. We'll talk about line art. We'll talk about like, oh, how did they do this? You know, literally we end up like trying to draw with chopsticks in order to emulate a certain kind of line uh, that somebody did, or we pull out the razor blades and try to, you know, figure out, is this a razor blade line? How did they do that? You know. <laughs> dissect things. And uh, we've been talking about different ways. And we've been talking about doing like a Patreon or something like that, where we could get into different things that people are interested in. So if people are like really into uh, the reproduction stuff, and they think that, um, you know, this is a topic that they would like to learn more about. That's one of the things we're considering doing when we launch a Patreon. What and, is the name of your podcast uh, of, the, of your YouTube channel? Uh, Living the Line. And uh you know, we're, we're sort of trying out different things right now. You know, it feels like, you know, casting off in different directions. But this, this type of topic, if this is something that people are really into, you know, you can let us know. And uh, when we launch our uh, Patreon, hopefully fairly soon, this is something that we might include in there. You know, Carson's a, a, a college professor who does, you know, drawing lessons and things like that. And so that's another resource that we've considered. Um, you know, we've considered making it a sort of cartoonist boot camp type thing where like, you know, you could take a project all the way from the you know nuts to soup as it were 
Um, but uh, anyway, um, this is one of these little things like it's funny, I didn't even, you know, consider talking about that. But as soon as you asked me, of course, that's something that you want to think about. Um, that's where my brain is going right now. It's just like there, there are there are literally hundreds of these type of things that have come up, you know, in the past seven years of doing this stuff um, that I'm happy to share the knowledge of. It's just a matter of trying to figure out a way that I could have enough time to do it, you know. Um, I'm sorry to derail us again. <laughs> no, no, that's that. It, it, this is great. There's so much information that you're giving out here. Like I'm taking notes and some of the stuff I'm just defaulting to, I will have this video as a reference. Um, so <laughs> it, it's good to know, you know, like everybody's at different levels of this stuff, but the idea of, you know, years ago, I, I visited um, Tom Kaczynski who publishes uncivilized books. And I, I was a fan at the time he was doing mostly mini comics. And um, I visited his studio production space and I was shocked because like the equipment, I looked around and it was essentially what I had in my cube at my old design job, you know, a, a long arm paper cutter and, you know, relatively basic stuff, a, a black and white laser printer. And yet he was making these mini comics that to me were some of the best looking mini comics I had seen. And whenever I saw what tools he was using, it was like, oh, I have no excuse because this is, this, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that we all have. Like my, my scanner is the cheapest 11 by 17 scanner I could find. So if you look at this and think scan wise, this is fine. Yep. That's awesome. Because, you know, I used to have a, a an Epson 10,000 XL that I, bought, I used and it was great. But I mean, what are those like $5,000 or something new They're You know, they're very expensive. Yeah. The scanner that I scanned this Abdullah, the butcher drawing, was like two hundred dollars, um, yeah. you know. So the idea that you could get by with this, you know, a relatively affordable equipment is amazing. So you know, everybody that's watching this and thinking, how do they make their work look better? I think it's we're all at different stages of what we know to do, what we've done. Um, but you've laid out like just a number of a, a lot of information that I think is probably going to apply to everybody a little bit differently depending on where they're at and what they're making. And I right. appreciate that a lot. Well, what, one thing I will say is um, the difference between your $200 scanner and the Epson, which, th by the way, that is the very best scanner that's on the market. The Epson, I think it's like a 12,000 XL now is the new number, but it's essentially optically exactly the same as the 10,000 XL, which is what I have in my closet over here. Um, that's what I use. Uh, the difference between those is that the scanning element is very different. Uh, and the your workforce, Epson workforce, has a very narrow focal length. So if you look at, do you see the spiral here? Yes. It basically spirals into blurriness. If you have any amount of lift whatsoever on your, on your scanner, you're gonna have a blurry uh, image. And in fact, um, it, it's not a problem. This is actually looks great to me and it enhances the objectness. But if you look at this little area right here, you'll see that you have a divot in the yes. paper, you've got an ink buildup that has caused a little bit of moisture on there, and it's actually divoted into blurriness uh, right there. I think that enhance the, enhances the look of this uh, in this particular case because the objectness is so important to the, you know, what you're doing. And this is a very cool look uh, to it. But that that is that scanner element has basically a focal length of approximately, you know, <laughs> two millimeters or something like that. As soon as something lifts off the page at all, you start having issues, and um, uh, so that's uh, the 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 more expensive Epson uh, series has a much wider focal length, and so you can do object scanning. Uh, if you have a certain amount of lift, it's not really an issue. You know, if you do paste up or something like that, you're not going to have any issues or things like that. But as far as the fidelity uh, goes, you know, the, everything that's being made right now should be reasonable. <laughs> there are exceptions there sure. are exceptions but yeah and price shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a, a, a issue right now should should we take a look at something else or are, are we yeah if you have time like maybe yeah. we could look at red room uh four scan and um you know like questions i have here one we can you can talk to us about prepping line art yeah um but the other piece would be uh original art right like a lot of us are into artist editions and um you know like one thing that that ed and i have talked about is doing a print series of these like the original art from these alternative covers that i did for red room right and um man your your uh you know print on demand story from a minute ago makes me very eager to try that now <laughs> but i wonder if you could talk to us about those two things so prepping line art and then also maybe how you would approach 
original art scans, um, you know, like as yeah. an artist edition. So first off, um, if, if you are trying to, um, I, what, the first thing I would say is that uh, keep all your stages of everything. Uh, when I uh, and keep them separated from each other. So when I'm doing the service project, I get all the original art scans and I have everything for a certain book in a folder that is labeled original art scans and then has the source. And then if I get scans from Gerhard uh, for the pages that he has, I save those in a separate place. You always got to keep these things separated. And the, my logic for this is if somewhere down the road, Dave wants to do a full size color reproduction of an entire book or something like that, why should he have to scan all those things again? He's already scanned them in color. Uh, by the way, uh, scanning in grayscale doesn't exist. If you ask your scanner to scan in grayscale, all it does is scans in color and then throws out two of the sensors randomly. You never want to scan in grayscale because there's no point to it. Um, you don't want to randomly throw out the colors. Uh, you want to have control over where that color goes and which channel is being used. In some cases, the, the channel, color channels on a scanner even have different sharpnesses. And uh, the blue ones are notoriously bad, uh, noisier sensors than the other two. I don't know <laughs> what the deal is with that. Uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, uh, but uh, it's true. Uh, so anyway, uh, keep all these things separate. So for instance, if you've got a series, uh, all of your Red Room covers have all been set, uh, scanned, you know, put them in a folder, color Red Room. Um, and then when you are making a script for this, and we'll go ahead and do this as a script so we can uh, see it. So we'll call this... Um, Red room color to bitmap or color to cleanup, let's call it, because we're actually not actually going to make a bitmap file. Um, so when I'm looking at this, this scan looks good to me. I'm going to go in. Okay, so I see that you printed it out in some type of blue line process. I can see that your blue line process was not just with the blue of your uh, printer. So perhaps something to tweak in the future just to make it easier to eliminate it and not have any noise. And I can see that you you see this softness here. Yes. So this softness is because the resolution that you've scanned this at, um, the this is butting up against the resolution of your scan. So this means that you're going to need more sharpness, more sharpening in order to retain all of those details at the final stage. So this is butting up against the resolution space that we're in right now. Um, so let's take a look at what the resolution space is. I'm going to hit Control Alt I, and I'm going to bring this up. So I see that your resolution is 4, 000, or 450 pixels per inch, and it looks like your original was drawn on 11 by 17 paper, probably a 10 by 5 or a, sorry, 10 by 15 active image area, something like that. That sounds so, all right. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate as much of that blue as I can. So I'm going to go in, uh, I'm going to make a uh, script here for it. So I've got my script turned on down here. It says red room color to clean up. And I'm going to go uh, image adjustments, black and white. This black and white filter enables you to grab color bands and adjust the darkness or lightness of those color bands individually. So in this case, by taking the cyan and the blue color bands, it looks like we, uh, and pushing them up, it gets rid of most of what you had right there. There's a little bit left over, which means that you weren't printing 100% blue, but that's okay. It's, it might, we might have a little bit of noise to clean up, uh, but it doesn't look like that. It looks pretty good right now. So now you can see that it added it to our script here. So we've got black and white. And you can break that down if you want to see what the actual control was. So now, as long as you are scanning everything with the same settings, you could just run a script, you know, once we're done with our script. Mm -hmm. So we're going to bring this into a higher resolution space. Uh, did you say this was reproduced in color, right? With color on top of it? Yes. So we're not going to go overkill here. We're going to bring this into 1,200 pixels per inch, unless you want to uh, go full, full bore. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Okay. So, so um, actually, hold on. I got to convert the mode first. So I'm going to go image mode grayscale. I'm going to discard my color information. And then I'm going to hit um, Alt Control I again. And I'm going to uh, change this top part to percentage. And I'm going to reduce it to 60%, which is probably approximately what you know the reduction was 
to the to imprint you know you can do this to whatever percentage it is that you're going to do and then after you have that you're going to go to resolution and i'm going to change that to 1200 pixels per inch and we get a little preview of what that's going to look like now because you didn't use any screen tone in your image i'm going to use as mode i'm going to use preserve details uh this is a very 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 esoteric <laughs> thing basically uh, if you're doing line art uh, by cubic is usually best um especially if you're going to have any screen tone or anything like that mechanical tone uh, if you're using color preserve details is going to be best in this case since you don't have any um screen tone on your image and i don't know if you ever use screen tone we'll just go ahead and use preserve details oh okay. i use screen tone oh you do okay. <laughs> once in a while <laughs> so so we'd use uh, by cubic then um and then it resizes it so now our resolution space is that higher resolution so if you look now our our size is seven by ten and our resolution is 1200 pixels per inch but our job is not done <laughs> because all of this softness is not going to translate to a sharp bitmap so let's make a copy and duplicate this layer here we'll call this sharpened i'll make a new layer here we'll call this cleanup i'm so embarrassed it's we're, we're zoomed in on my signature which was one of my mistakes you see the 22 <laughs> <laughs> I, I corrected that after the fact That's no great. idea where my mind was at the time <laughs> you were just hoping that this year would be over uh, and we're going to go to layer new adjustment layer threshold this is what's going to convert our image to line art we can turn this on and off to get a preview and if you look you can see certain areas of the your line art are just dis disappearing when we do the threshold conversion those areas are not sufficiently sharp or don't present sufficient enough contrast to survive the bitmap making process so let's zoom right in on there and we can watch the lines disappear you also notice that all that stuff in the black goes right away okay don't futz with your blacks <laughs> you almost never have to clean up black unless there's a big problem for some reason this is just a thing that people like to like their brains like to fill it in like you're coloring by numbers it's a total waste of time um there's almost never a need to do that so anyway uh, i'm going to turn off the threshold and i'm going to click on my sharpen layer uh you can see that our script just added all of those things right <laughs> So I'm going to stop the script for a second. I'm going to delete all that, except for the first one, hide current layer. That just turns off our threshold. And then I'm going to restart our script. And I'm going to go to filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. And like I said before, even though this is called unsharp mask, that just has to do with how it was originally produced. It's sharpening is all this is. That just happens to be what the name of the tool is. If you're talking about this process, you call it sharpening. Um, and um, what I'm looking for is a, a setting that is going to spike the sharpness of our line art there. So I'm gonna make the amount go up fairly high. And look at that, all of a sudden those are nice and sharp and black. Uh, and the radius that I have is fairly low right here. And the threshold is actually fairly low too. And basically the what you wanna, get right here when it comes to line art is basically can you make the lines sharper without bringing up too much noise in the black areas that's the that's the um that's the trade-off that you've got here and not just noise in the case here i can actually see a white line forming where you worked that edge with a different tool i don't know if it's because you you drew a portion of that with a i'm not sure exactly what and that looks pretty good to me. Uh, my radius is fairly low. I like to keep the radius on something like this somewhere between uh, one and one and a half pixels. Depending on how blurry something is, you might need to go higher than that, but this looks actually pretty good. So let's take a look at that. And we're gonna test this out by turning on our threshold. And now you see all of your lines are preserved. Um, so let's go ahead and depending on how detailed you've gotten here you can see that we've got it's a little bit of like sort of noisy stuff from that blue line process and it doesn't look like that's surviving the threshold 
So actually, this is probably just fine. If you had gone finer in here, we would add a couple uh, other steps. What we would do is uh, bring up a curves control. Like I said before, very similar to levels, but um, Photoshop is busted when it comes to levels currently. Uh, and I'm going to knock out a little bit of paper here with my curves control. And I'm going to bring up the black point just a little, just a hair. And you can see those things. You can see the spike. This is all of the unused bandwidth on the top here. I'm going to knock out just a little bit of the more of the paper. I'm going to do that one more time. And then I'm going to add one more layer of mild sharpening. Oop, and I just accidentally added the same level of sharpening we did before. Um, but not my intention. My computer is running a little slow because I've got Zoom uh, going. This is giving me like a little lag for some reason. But basically, this is this is the same sort of two-stage sharpening that we did with the color image. And I'm just going to get just the teeniest bit here, and this will just make sure that we're reinforcing uh, all of the, the sharpest areas. Now, if you look, it's not just the lines that are getting sharpened. It's the it's your shadow areas. I'm going to turn this on and off so you can see what I mean. So all of the hatching that you did in here in these dense areas is now showing up. Now, the thing is, wow. somebody might be saying right now, oh, well, that's all going to fill in when it's printed anyway. Well, all of these things are incremental improvements that you can make. Each of these things are like chipping away at the problem. And, um, you know, the, 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 more trusted a printer that you have, the better paper that you're printing on, the uh, better those things are going to be preserved. And they can't be preserved at all if you didn't preserve them in the first place, if you didn't deliver them to them. So this is basically a finished image. This is ready for export. So at this point, I would save and close this. And the reason for that is because anytime you can batch something, you should be batching something. So after I've saved and closed this thing, or I've cleaned up, you know, the outside areas. So like, you know, we could do a quick cleanup right now and use the marquee tool. Let's see that this is all this is all pre script. So I would basically run this script on every page for your book, and then go in and do cleanup as a separate stage, so that you don't ever have to be sitting watching waiting for a computer to do something. Um, and uh, let's just do like a little AB here. I'm going to zoom in on an area of high detail, hit threshold. And we can just see what the difference is that our sharpening process made. And uh, the other thing that this difference that we made here is that we brought our image into a high resolution space, a much higher resolution space than it was uh, previously. And so each of these lines on the curve has more information to look like a smoother kind of curve. And you can imagine when you start to see something up close like this, you can imagine why that resolution really matters. So for instance, if we were to make this in 2,400 pixels per inch, you would have four times as many of these pixels here. And, uh, you know, resolution doesn't matter until it does. If you've got a one pixel uh, line, as in it's, it's, you know, one pixel across, and it's going straight up and down, that might survive. A low resolution space because that straight up and down is along the dimension that the sampling is happening if you have a line that's a curve that's going to look horrible in a low resolution space because that's going to be made up of stair steps it's going to be made up of crude blocks if you have a line that's just barely off the straight that's just going to look absolutely terrible in a low resolution space so all of these things are sort of edge cases here the finer that you work the more that resolution matters. Right. Uh, the more black and white something, the more that resolution matters. So anyway, the last stage after you've done all your cleanup, you've scripted everything and made them all like this, would be to mode, convert to bitmap. And that should be the actual thing that you are delivering to the printer is this one bit image. Now, Photoshop does artists no favors by making one bit images look pretty horrid in Photoshop uh, until you've actually done the conversion. Um, somebody at Adobe must hate line art uh, <laughs> because they've got things set up so that you can just mess this up so many different ways. Uh, all of the default 
uh, PDF export settings are set so that line art is converted to an absolutely horrid resolution. You have to manually change that every time that you open a new Adobe product for the first time. Um, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you end up with this mess of pixels every time you export something. And um, anyway, this is going to look faithful to your drawing board. And if it were going to be reproduced in black and white and you'd use really, really, really ultra fine lines, that extra bit of resolution you could get from doing it in 2,400 pixels per inch would be better. Wow. I feel like I thought I knew what I was doing coming into this conversation. <laughs> and uh, there are quite a few things that I have, can improve on. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's there's no end to the amount of these types of things that you can actually, uh, you know, learn. Uh, I mean, I, I was mentioning uh, bitmap images, or, or sorry, I was mentioning uh, negatives earlier. I mean, I you really want to blow your mind. Let's take a peek at, um, let's see, what did I, I think I have some negative images for the last day, the last uh, Cerebus book. Here's some negative scans that just came in for this book. I'm just going to open a random page here. So we got negative scans for uh, pages that um, we don't have original artwork for. Let's take a look at this, what it actually looks like in person. So this is what it looks like in person. It's a reverse image of the actual thing. If you if you zoom in, it looks uh, relatively on off. Uh, but there's actually hidden information in here. So let's take a look at this dot tone up close. I'm going to convert it back to where it was. So let's use our curves uh, command. Now, even getting a good scan of a negative, this took weeks of work trying to figure out the optimal way to scan these so that they would actually be able to do what we needed them to do. But let's take a look at what happens when you grab a curves control with this. All of a sudden, you're seeing all of this hidden information, and some of it is just dirt and you know stuff on the schmutz on the negative that'll have to be cleaned out but if you pull that all the way away you'll see that it, it's not just affecting this is a really good scan of a of a negative it's not just affecting the darkness and lightness of the black areas it's actually literally affecting the density of the tone and the size of the fine lines so we were talking about copy dot scans before and how all these publishers have thrown out their physical um, objects. Well, I can take this tone and turn this thing that was basically going to reproduce too dark into a thing that's going to reproduce perfectly. This is this page in particular is going to look almost indistinguishable from the original artwork because it was photocopied really well. The only way it's going to look like that, though, is if it's handled correctly by somebody after it's been scanned. And uh, that handling, this is a little this is a little light. We want a little light here. Uh, but you can see basically like what, what I mean by that, just by toggling back and forth. Um, essentially, like you can do a density control uh, to the scan negative. In other words, the negative is not like a bitmap. Uh, the negative is like those grayscale files that I'm saving from the original artwork where you have a certain amount of play in them and you can change that density. Uh, very easily. And uh, if you know things about the product and the artwork and the original artwork, you can, you know, there's an awful lot of play uh, in there. So, you know, publishers out there with historic uh, projects, uh, especially historic projects that have, um, that don't exist in original artwork form, you know, you want to know what you're uh, up against, uh, give me a call and uh, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what else can I, what I, what else can I tell you? I think that's uh, I'm I'm pretty good. That that is a much more detailed uh, trip into this process than I expected. Um, like I said, Sean, uh, one thank you again for your time on this. But it feels like real information that I can apply to everything I produce going forward, and even some stuff that hasn't left my hands yet right. that I can uh, do uh, you know redo and and improve. So yeah, wow. Um, I don't know. I think that I think that's pretty good. Well, the, the only other thing I'd say is just that to keep in mind that these tools exist for us, you know, and the same thing goes with working with printers. The same thing goes with selecting paper. Uh, these things exist so that we can 
have better representations of the things that we're making uh, out there. And, uh, you know, sometimes, like I said, you know, it didn't take me any longer to produce that high resolution uh, bitmapped image uh, for your for your cover there than it would have if we were doing it at a low resolution space. It's just that the file that I'm saving is larger. Right. Well, I mean, storage space is basically free right now. I mean, what what are we worried about hard drive space? You know, um, whenever you're saving these files, like once you mm -hmm. adjust that that initial scan, yeah. Um, are you saving them as like an uncompressed TIFF? That's exactly it. yeah. Uh, well, I, you can use um. There's a there's a lossless uh, compression you can use on TIFF. It's called a LZW yes. compression. So when you save, let's just go to save as. Um, I'm gonna say save as TIFF, and you can see uh, we've got an option for LZW compression, and that'll reduce your file size, uh, but not have any kind of image impact at all. TIFF is basically, if you don't know, is basically like a container format. So there's lots of different image image types that can be saved inside it. And if you hit JPEG, it's even if it says TIFF on the end, it's still compressing it as a JPEG and hiding it inside of that container. Um, I, I use TIFF, uh, layered TIFF files instead of Photoshop files, um, just because I'm paranoid. Uh, TIFF is a global standard that um, everybody has access to. And the the way that the, the file works is, is um, publicly available and is not gonna change at any point. <laughs> uh, whereas I don't trust necessarily that Adobe, you know, 20 years from now, isn't gonna do something to a PSD where you have to update in order to use it or some other thing along those lines. I just, I feel like TIFF is just the safest way to go for that stuff. So I, any project that I work on, I basically have three different sets of files. I have the raw scans, I have the layered TIFF files that are all the ones that I've made script adjustments to. I've scripted them all out and then I've cleaned them up. And then I have a bitmap folder that's all of the export. And that that's done by script too. I just read a script that all it says is turn this into a one bit image file. And then I turn the script on and it looks at the folder and it puts all the images into the other folder. And uh, like I said, I've worked with a few artists where they just want some tips on this. I just do a freelance rate with them and I make them scripts. And that's something they can do themselves. That way they get control over the process. They can see what the script does. They can use it themselves. And then I'll just do a little bit of consultation with them and just say, yeah, that looks good. That doesn't look good. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> that type of stuff. I may need to uh, contact you whenever I start putting together this, this uh, ballpoint pen. Sure. Book, it'd be, it'd be, so. be a pleasure. And like I said, scan them all in the same, same settings uh, <laughs> so that you can have the bulk of the work done for you. Absolutely. This is what we've got computers for, you know? All right. Um, Sean, where, uh, any plugs for yourself? Where should people find you? Uh, well, uh, Carson and I are, uh, Carson Grubaugh, uh, who's the co-artist on Strange Death of Alex Raymond, uh, he and I are doing a YouTube channel, uh, and it's called Living the Line. And uh, right now, a lot of uh, book reviews and uh, flip-throughs and some tool talk in relationship to book reviews. So we'll take and dissect a certain technique and uh, try to figure out what the tools are. And uh, we're hoping at some point very soon to uh, launch a Patreon and also to try a few different series uh, one series might be a tech uh, centered series where we go through some of these same types of things, but like basically take it topic by topic. I feel like I gave you the fire hose today. <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> of information. I, right. I, and I apologize for that. I don't really know how to modulate the fire hose. Sometimes you got to just take one topic and just blast that one out instead. So this would be more like everything you need to know about color space and then how to set up your scanner so that uh, your scanner is getting ac accurate color, how to how to calibrate your monitor. Um, all these are things that, you know, you can do quickly um, if you know what you're doing and um, improve everything that you do. Anyway, uh, we're going to do that on our YouTube channel and uh, probably a Patreon. Um, and uh, if you guys, uh, anybody watching this hasn't um, read The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, uh, when it comes out in December 1st, I hope that you will do so. Uh, and uh, I'm publishing books under uh, Living the Line Books. And um, I'm also a freelance illustrator because there's not enough going on. <laughs> livingtheline.com uh you can check that out and um yeah all right well thank you very much sean really appreciate it for everybody watching at home make more comics <laughs>